How is everybody? Good. Thank you for showing up so early on this nice, brisk Canada morning. Um, I'm quite thrilled and honored to be here. I love going to a place that feels like it's close to where I live, but it's a world away. And the, the idea and concept of culture and language and the fact that I sort of dropped into this place quite late last night, so anything could happen, just to warn you, because we had some storms in the middle of the country. Um, and there's a different language dynamic uh, that I'm used to, which just makes everything feel a little more exotic and wonderful. So thank you for having me. Um, so I will just say bonjour, and that's about all I'll do in French, because trust me, you don't want to hear me attempt any more than that. So I'll do it in English if that's okay with you, even though I know most of you speak French. So this is what we're going to, uh, to talk about today. And uh, this will be casual. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy it, uh, but I make no promises. Um, and we're going to try some different things. The first thing we're going to try is a, a, a small uh, experiment. So uh, as you sort of heard before, I, I, I'm a futurist at a, at a movie studio, which is a very odd job. Um, in fact, it's not that much of a job at all. I, very, I find it very hard to sort of find the job-like parts of it. Um, and people often ask, what do you do? And I often have to kind of think what I do on a day-to-day -day basis because it changes. But the best way I'd sort of describe it in short order is that I work in a pretend industry, in the motion picture industry, which makes their living creating pretend. And I have a pretend job in a pretend industry. So that's how we'll define it. You'll get a little more from the slides in a little bit. But that gives you a sort of a, a sense of who I am and kind of what I get to do for a living. So before we actually get started technically with the talk and start using the slides, I'm going to make a prediction here, a futurist prediction, that we have 100% saturation in this room of something we would define as pocket robots. I believe every one of you have a pocket robot, and you use it more than you think. So if you have one, you might call it a smartphone, or an iPhone, or an Android phone. If you have one, take it out. We're going to do a little experiment. Miriam, you want to come and help me? My good friend, no? You're just going to sit there in the corner? I know you've got one, because you guys see it in your hand. At least stand up and stand over here so you can help me. This is my friend Miriam, who asked me to come. and She's always so well put together. Her hair is just fantastic. It's just great. OK. so. Everybody's got one of these, yeah? We're at 100% saturation. Hold them up nice and high. Yeah, look at that. OK, now here's what we're going to do very quickly. Keep them up. Swap them with your neighbor. So Miriam, you're going to take mine. I'm going to take yours. OK? This is typically the reaction I get. I've done this in very large auditoriums with six or 7,000 people. Now take your new, your new phone, your new pocket robot, put it in your pocket or your purse. How's everybody doing? <laughs> See how you feel. Now here's the trick. I give a second to settle in here. Now here's the trick to this. The goal is to see how long you can hold out. Because what we're defining on this wonderful chilly morning is that that is way more than just a phone. And we're going to discover through some of the things I talk about what it actually is and what it actually isn't. OK, so everybody with me so far? Everybody feeling slightly uncomfortable, right? <laughs> That's typically what happens. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. If I look around the crowd, I could make an assumption that maybe one of us would end up in jail tonight. It's not out of the, the realm of possibility. It's cold, you're drinking, God knows what could happen, right? So here's the first question I would ask you. Now that you don't have that little pocket robot friend with you, it's just like a foot and a half away from you, right? If you did end up in prison, you know, they take your phone away, right? So who would you call if you didn't have your phone? You might know, like, your parents' phone number where you grew up. Maybe you know one or two other phone numbers. But if they don't answer the phone, you're screwed. Like, you don't know anybody's phone number. Your pocket robot knows the phone number. You have given away some of your brain, some of your humanity to technology. And we seem to be quite comfortable doing this, right? I presume some of you drive sometimes, right? Try and think about the last time you drove anywhere without firing up your pocket robot and saying, 
Even though I know how to go there, please tell me which way you would go, Mr. Robot. What are the right ways to do this? So this is a thing that is actually happening maybe more often than you realize, which is part of the reason I asked you to take your technology that you have with you and connected to you and just move it away from your person, just slightly to see how you feel. And you heard the reaction and you felt the reaction, right? So I like this quote a lot. And this is kind of what I do for a living, when people sort of have to really define beyond the kitsch of I work in the land of pretend. Um, this is a quote from a famous movie, Cowboy, who was also quite a famous innovator named Will Rogers. And he said, basically, even if you're on the right track, you will get run over if you just sit there. Who believes that? I fully believe that. So, a lot of people think because I do this now and I built some interesting things over my life and had some interesting sort of life and creativity, which I'm quite fortunate and very honored to have just the ability to live inside these worlds. Um, I, people say at some point you become a, a thought leader and I don't like that term. I, I try and keep myself as a thought doer. I like to do things to see what actually comes of it. Um, and I believe this sort of at my heart, that you have to do things so you don't get run over. You have to just not think about the fact that it's going to change. You have to be part of the change. And I think this center is probably a good example of that. They're actually demonstrating change. They understand it. They want to, to elevate it and relish it and make it important, which is part of probably why you showed up this morning instead of doing something else in the cold. OK, some quick statistics to look at. We're not going to go over all these in detail. I'm just going to go over a couple of these, which I really think are interesting. There's about 7 billion people on planet Earth. Did you know that more people own cell phones than own toothbrushes? Which is kind of interesting, right? If you lost your wallet today, I presume some of you still use wallets, right, to keep your sort of personal effects. If you lost your wallet on average, it takes a little over a day to report you lost your wallet. If you lost your pocket robot, it takes you a little over an hour to completely freak out and start alerting people that you've lost your phone. It's just a thing to think about, right? This one's really interesting, the one at the bottom. You touch your cellular phone around 2,600 times in a typical day. So think about that. Now that it's just slightly out of your person. You're not getting to touch it now for the next 45 minutes an hour. Shall we talk about a cautionary tale for a moment? We know those companies, right? We've all been around the planet enough to know and remember that thing called Blockbuster. My wife actually used to work there, believe it or not. Um, and we all know this one in the red. So let's take a look at some numbers. And this is an interesting thing to think about. So if we look at Blockbuster, in 2004, not all that long ago, Blockbuster was making $6 billion a year. Not a bad haul, right? Two years later, they were still fine. Five and a half. Two years after that, they're still making $5 billion a year. 2009, yes, they've slid down $2 billion, but they're still making $4 billion a year. They're fine as a company. It's not a problem. Somewhere between 2009 and a year later, $4 billion a year to, thank you, we're done, good night. Bankrupt. So why? This is why. So right as Blockbuster was doing great, there's this other little entity that's sort of sneaking up in the back door, literally started in someone's apartment. 2004, they're a half a million dollar, half a billion dollar company. By 2006, they're almost a billion dollar company. By 2008, between 2008 and 2009, they start to crack $2 billion a year, right at the point that Blockbuster is making about twice as much as them, and most of the people at Blockbuster are saying, we're fine. Now, if you look at the name of that company, 2004 to 2008, they were mostly doing DVDs via the mail. But their instinct was not to call their company Mailflix. They called it Netflix because they were preparing for a change. And it was starting to happen. And the early adopters felt the pain of the change. We used to call it buffering. And you would wait and wait and wait. But you were still kind of a little better than waiting for the DVD to come in the mail and ship it back. By 2009, they were on their meteoric rise up, and Blockbuster, who thought they were fine, was not so fine, and by 2012, kaboom, right? Now, this is actually a bigger number. It's around $160 billion valuation. Anybody want to guess what Blockbuster's valuation is today? A little less than $160 billion, right? About $160 billion less, in fact. So this is an interesting thing to think about. 
We'll talk a little bit more about that too. Shall we talk about this for a second? <laughs> this is another area to study when you study change. So if you're starting to get an instinct about what I really do for a living, I study change in all forms and formulations. Because change across one industry gives you leading indicators to change across another industry. So here's the landscape of retail in the United States in 2006. Want to see what happened 10 years later? Anybody curious? 10 years later, that's retail. 18 billion in 2006, half a trillion in 2016. The only one left that's really even putting up a fight is Walmart. The rest of them are pretty much relegated to, we get it, we, we didn't pay attention, we didn't act on change. Sears is gone now, technically. J.C. Penney is, for all intents and purposes, gone. Best Buy is holding on, but not really. Target maybe might come out the other side. Walmart putting up a fight. Two years later, we all know because we saw the news stories, right? Doubled in two years. That's a massive amount of power in one organization's hands. So, if you're curious about this stuff, and you want a little more than the quick little short one minute story, which actually glosses over the effects, right? A lot of people like me that like to present this stuff, this is very good fodder, like you get it right away. But there's a much more nuanced story to this that would take a good half hour to explain. Part of that story is that all of these companies had a chance to not let what happened to them happen to them. But they had difficulty finding their way. In fact, Many of the executives at Blockbuster, all the way at the top level, were keeping a very close eye on this thing called Netflix and addressed their board on numerous occasions saying, we got to be careful. There's something, there's change afoot, there's something happening. And the board was like, we're making $4.3 billion, we're fine, don't worry about it, stay the course. It's not like some of the people at Blockbuster didn't realize that something was going to happen. So if you're curious and want to read more about it, and we can send you these links, this is a great article to read, how Blockbuster, Kodak, and, and Xerox really failed, and it's not quite what you think. They did actually try to survive. Um, so you can find it. We're actually going to talk about Kodak in a little bit, just a fair warning, if you want to leave before we talk about Kodak. OK, so that's kind of act one. That's where I like to start. Now we're going into act two. Act two is about this thing we call innovation. And I sort of make the argument, which you may or may not agree with, that the most influential companies today that we interface with all the time really didn't start out as businesses. They didn't even have a thought in their head that they wanted to be a business. They actually started out as a hobby. And they literally very often started out in garages, which is why we call them garage startups, right? There's a terminology to it. There's Walt Disney, which is a very, very deep connection to me, which you'll learn over a little bit of time here, literally started in the shed in the back of his mom's house. Literally. They were not trying to make a business. They were trying to solve a problem. They were sometimes trying to solve multiple problems in new ways, with new thinking. OK, so considering this day is about storytelling and technology, I thought I would bring some of that ethos into this talk. People like to see those words, right? You're, there's something in your brain and your body that's now getting a little bit more excited than the last 10 minutes. You're like, hmm, he's going to tell me a story. This is exciting. Whether you admit it or not. Uh, trust me, I know. Because every time someone says, I want to tell you a story, you're like, uh-oh, it's going to be good. <laughs> so this is a little story about risk and reward. Very simple. Risk and storytelling. That's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. And we're also going to talk about the interlaced technology that plays into the equation. Now, I want you to notice that the word storytelling is much larger than the words interlaced technology. There's a reason for that. We're going to talk about that. OK, so who likes to take risks? Who profits from it? Everyone has a different comfort zone when it comes to this thing called risk, right? Most people shy away from it. Most shy away. Because there are consequences. That is the bottom line. If you take risks, there will be a consequence. Good, bad, something in the middle. So let's look at that for a second. So like. It's a very simple question. What's the worst that can happen if you take a risk, right? We think about this every time we take a risk. What's the absolute worst that can happen? You want to see? That's the worst that can happen. That's literally the worst that can happen. You die. 
and we all chuckle. But that is the actual equation. That's what the lizard brain is doing every time you take a risk. Every time someone gets up on a stage like this, part of my brain is saying, I could die up here. <laughs> like, there's a reason like where comedians say, I died on stage, right? Because, and it's why people are so terrified of public speaking. Now, people like me have a smaller part of that brain that lets them do this. Doesn't mean I don't get nervous. Trust me, I get nervous. I've been so nervous that once in Australia, I fell off a stage like this. So just for those in the front row, if I get too close, you want to be like, stop. Now, let's look at the other side of the equation. What's the best that can happen if you take risks? You help yourself. You help others. You help your family. You help your community. You help your country. You help the world. You make change. That's the best that can happen if you take a risk. Oh, yeah, and you also can get a jet, which isn't so bad. Right? Risk is exposure. It exposes things, right? It exposes our strengths, our weaknesses, our flaws. That's why risk is so hard to take for humans. So I work for a movie studio. I work for a couple of them. And I've worked in the entertainment business in some way, shape, or form my whole life in various ways. Movie studios thrive or wither based on the chances they take. And if those chances pay off, they are in the risk pool all day long. And by the way, very often those chances do not pay off. But enough of them pay off that they can keep the lights on for the next year and the next year and the next year if you're doing it well enough. That being said, I've worked for a couple of movie studios now in the past six, seven years. I've worked for that one, and I've worked for that one, and I work for this one currently. These are not startups. They've been around for a day or two. Fox has been around for over 80 years, soon to be in their new risk zone because you all know that they're moving into Disney's world, right? Paramount's the grandfather of all of them, over 100 years on the planet. It's a big deal that it's been around for 100 years. There are very few companies that have been around that long, that have been able to survive risk-reward that long. The thing I actually do every day is this. I think and challenge these entities to see if they can actually act like a startup, if they can get into the full risk zone. Not pretend, not say that they're doing it, but actually do it. That's what I do every day. So I want to talk about this book for a second. Who here has read this book? Let me see. Way to go. More people than less. I would recommend, if you've come to this and you're hearing me talk and you're going to spend the day learning about story and dynamics, you want to read this book. There's a very simple equation as to why. Now, this book is amazing, and there's lots of tenets and things that are fantastic in this book that are extremely illuminating and clarifying. But there's one thing that absolutely floored me, because I knew it all along. It just no one ever defined it in the way that this book defined it. There's literally one thing that human beings, us in this room, homo sapiens, can do that to our knowledge no other species on planet Earth can do. Does anybody? Don't answer if you've read the book. If you haven't read the book, take a guess. Anybody want to take a guess? I'll tell you. Say that again. Tell stories. Tell stories. That's the answer. Stand up. Take a bow. <laughs> it's harder to get to that answer. You hadn't read the book. No. Fantastic. It's harder to get to that answer than you might realize. There is literally one thing that we do that nothing else on planet Earth that lives or sentient beings can do is create and tell stories, create fiction. This is a fiction, and we'll talk about that in a second. Here's some key like moments of this book. The book is giant. So these are just a couple of things to look at. As we talk about, I'll bring them up, you can read them. These are just some things that I think are really valuable. So as you read these things, Think about what we're doing right now. We've all gathered in this place. This is not real. It's artificial. Someone made this. Every single thing about this. Someone made the chairs, made the clothes you're wearing, made the fact that I have this microphone on and I'm standing here, and I've created a story dynamic here. Other animals can't do this. Imagine in this environment like this, there's other animals that are very close to us genetically. Like one little tweak of the DNA. Imagine if instead of oh, 100 or so humans in here, there was 100 chimpanzees in here. And we asked all the chimpanzees, sit quietly in a little sloping arc and pay attention to this guy on the stage for an hour. Do you know what would happen? Chaos. <laughs> you ever been to a sporting event? It's amazing that 90,000 people can sit in a giant thing and not kill each other 
almost all the time. Every once in a while, we turn into other things other than humans. But for the most part, we somehow manage to eat popcorn, eat hot dogs, 90,000 people, and nobody kills each other. That's because we tell stories. Everything about that is a fiction. This is a fiction. If it was all real, we'd be wandering around in the grass outside, like looking for grubs. This is fiction. And speaking of fiction, I like to refer to this company a lot. Now, keep in mind, I don't work for this company, right? My bosses would probably be really upset that I talk about Pixar more than I talk about Paramount. But I think this is a really valuable company to talk about because out of all the modern entities that understand and create and deal with story and technology quite robustly, Pixar to me is the one entity that you can point to that really, really, really gets it. They put story where it belongs, main attraction. They put technology where it belongs, in the supporting cast. I have a very strong belief that when technology outpaces story, or tries to, things go off the rails. Does not connect to the human experience. It just connects to the technology experience. So, what we say, or at least what I say about technology, is it needs to be in a supporting role. As we say in our world of movies, we say, just happy to be nominated. That's it. And the reason I define Pixar as the one is because out of any entity where you look at like a whole breadth of motion picture equation, these guys know how to make you cry better than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> they know how to pull your heartstrings. And I rate the success of Pixar movies simply by how many times it makes you cry. Like Up is the big one because I got six full cries, like full on, right? Inside Out, absolutely. You know, some of the others, Bugs Life, Toy Story, they just get you. Coco just recently, I walked out of that, I actually screened it with a whole bunch of Disney executives, and I said to myself, that's everything that's right about the world. That's what the world should be. They understand story, and they use amazing technology to get you there. So just as you think about it, I'd say think about it. Okay, that's act two. Ready for act three? I often get this in the Q&A, so I thought, you know what? I always ask the question, and it takes extra time, so I'll just put it into the damn presentation, because <laughs> people ask. So here's the reason that I think I have this crazy job and I'm up here standing here. It's I, I grew up here. Anybody been here? I refer to this as the funnel of crazy. I grew up right there, in central Florida, right in the middle of the funnel of crazy. And you know, when you hear a news story, and you know what I'm talking about, it says, and in this unusual nugget, you're like, oh, it's coming. It's going to be in Florida. This is definitely going to be Florida. And of course, it always is Florida, right? So we moved down here. And I can tell you the story later if you want to hear the whole crazy story. But when I was very, very young, about six years old, from Brooklyn, New York, this is what Florida looked like when I moved as a little kid. It was agricultural. It was actually very, very southern, as we refer to in the worst possible way. There's wonderful things about southern, but there's some sort of bad things about southern. It was very, very racist. It was very backwards. It didn't elevate other cultures and other ideas. It was all about this one way, and this is the only way. And I got dropped into this at age six and a half. That was year one. You want to see what happened in year two? That was year two. So when I was seven and a half, this crazy guy, Walt Disney, decided he was going to get out of Anaheim, and he was going to try and do something bigger and broader, where he had more room to experiment, more room to play. And he decided to put it in this place called Florida. And I just happened to grow up there. So I grew up in a place that relished creativity, that relished risk, that understood that things are always going to change, that we're not going to live in the same place. We're going to try a lot of things. And if our audiences don't like them, we'll try something else. Turns out audiences really like this stuff, most of it. And a lot of stuff they didn't like, they would just change it. So I literally grew up in the world of the future. As a very, very young kid, it was very formative to me to understand that change was a good thing. There was a whole culture around me that just sprung up kind of out of nowhere in this very crazy place that said, this is okay. It's okay to try things. So a friend of mine at a, a talk that she was giving and I was giving in a, in a, a conference, where were we? I can't remember where we were. Um, and she said this, and I thought, you know, this is good. I'm gonna put this in my presentation. She said, part of what happens when you get old enough is you just, you play your greatest hits. 
that's what you do, right? You do a few things, it's noticed, people like you, they ask you to come give you a talk, but really what you're doing is you're just playing your greatest hits. So I've got a few, and I want to like make it as short and sweet as possible and not spend lots of Q&A time on it. So here's the story. So when I migrated into my young adult world, I stayed in that world of fantasy and creativity, and I worked for Disney and Nickelodeon and PBS. I became like a children's TV director for the most part. And I did a lot of stuff for MTV, and I was just with youth culture all the time. So I got to continue to foster this idea of being a big kid. Have you probably noticed that the way I talk and the things I think about, you're like, he's kind of like a 16-year-old boy, but he's got gray hair and he's like in his 50s. How does that work? This is how it works, because I grew up in this world. And then after I did this for like 20-something years, I migrated into the world of technology, but always with an eye towards story and creativity. I elevated and liked people that told stories. So I like to ask this question about how much does tech, actual tech, lead the risk taking in the evolution of storytelling? I don't actually know the answer, but I just want to postulate a little bit. So this is the stuff I help create. A couple other things along the way, but these are like my greatest hits. I built this movie camera that some of you may know or have used as part of the team. I was just part of the team that did it. I didn't actually build it. But I was very early on in it. And it was somewhat instrumental. And a lot of people use it for various things. So I want to talk about this for a second. So that's my greatest hits. That's all you get. You get a little nugget. But I do want to talk about this. Because this is a very important part of change, part of change dynamics. This is interesting. Do this now. Um, so we all know this company, right? We all have some degree of love and care for this company. Anybody know what this is? Doug, you probably know what this is, right? Anybody know what that is? That's the very first digital still camera ever built. It's built by a guy named Steve in the 70s for this company called Kodak. Young engineer, they put him on task and said, can you build something for us that maybe can teach us a thing or two about technology. He built this thing, it actually worked. It's a digital sensor, took a .0001 megapixel image, fairly low res, as we say. <laughs> the image was created in 23 milliseconds, fairly fast. It recorded to the storage mechanism of the day in about a minute and a half. It took a minute to write the image to that thing called a cassette tape, which some of you may remember fondly. So guess what the folks at Kodak at the top end did? They looked at this thing and they went, nice job, kid. Go back to work and leave us alone because no one's going to want this thing. No one's going to want a device that takes a minute to make a picture. Plus, it's gigantic and it's going to be expensive and forget it. But good on you, right, for giving it a go. We're going to be fine selling our yellow boxes with chemicals in them. Kind of like that blockbuster story a little bit, right? So years, years later, they did actually come up with a digital still camera. It was a flop. But the underlying core technology, that funny little pattern that looks like a chessboard or a checkers board, something called a Bayer pattern. It's the science beyond, behind, behind every digital camera that is used today, almost every, with very rare exceptions. You know who invented that science? Anybody want to guess? Kodak, correct. Kodak not only invented the digital camera, they also invented the science behind the digital camera. That's digital film. That's what digital film actually looks like in the very simplest form. So Kodak owned the patent for that, but couldn't capitalize on it, couldn't figure out how to put the idea that they cultivated into practice. Remember the, 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 um, the quote from the beginning, right? So everybody else capitalized. I was one of those people. Kodak owned that patent till, till 2007 when it expired. They did make billions of dollars on the patent, but they could have probably made trillions of dollars if they figured out how to act like a startup and cannibalize their business. But they were too afraid. They didn't understand how to cannibalize it, which is a hard thing to do when you've got a multi-billion dollar business. Eventually, Kodak, a few years later, after Red was on the scene, Canon and Nikon did a lot of stuff, they, they, they declared bankruptcy. They're still around in some much smaller form. Today, the next wave of disruption is afoot, which is that, right? That's it. That's the new wave of disruption. And that's not going to be the last wave of disruption. If you want to read more about this story, because it's interesting, I think it's super interesting, is those articles. Because this is the five-minute version. There's a five-hour version of the drama of this. All right. Now we're getting to Act 4. Now we're getting to the meaty stuff, the good stuff. So... The evolution of the screen and the stories that evolve from it. Here's what we're going to talk about, very, very simply. We're going to talk about the fact that I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Who thinks this is different than this? 
It is not. It's the same. It's just evolved, right? It's a screen. It's got a border. It's got a rectangle. We use these things all day long. You have one in your pocket right now, although not your own, which is kind of interesting. It's nice and a little relaxing, right? You get a little break from all that nonsense, right? But this is a screen. These things here, confidence monitors, they're all screens. We live with these things all day long. These are screens too. Very similar to those other screens. Very, very similar, right? As much as we think has changed about the core of why we use these things and why we love these things, it really hasn't changed that much. We've made them more nimble, we've made them more powerful, made them more colorful, but we really haven't changed them. They look kind of the same. The visual department of this is the same. This is a big change, not so much in the screen, in the humanity of using the screen, how we actually drive our digital universe. And when you create a change this big, New forms of story emerge from it, right? These are new forms of story that couldn't exist without a handheld screen, which is interesting to think about. Now let's think about this. So as a movie studio, I press a lot, and this makes movie studio guys somewhat uncomfortable, on this concept of interactive storytelling. Why do we care so much about it? Well, the bottom line is, outside of the creativity, this is the how do you get the jet part of the story, right? Is the single most successful entertainment piece of entertainment, single piece that we call, is not a movie or a TV show, it's a video game. It's one of the Grand Theft Auto series, Grand Theft Auto V. It's a very violent game. It's not high on my ethics list, but it is very high on my success dynamic list. Big, big swing to make it, $270 million to make the sucker. It's now eclipsed $7 billion. So I gotta like change the slide like you know, every few months. One piece of entertainment, $7 billion. Others are right in there. That franchise, well over 10. The Madden franchise, if you play video games, well over four. Some of your kids, and maybe you play Fortnite, God knows how many billion that's gonna make when it's done. So we gotta care about this. Whether we want to or not, whether we like video games or not, we have to care about this, and if there's time in Q&A, I can tell you how much these things tell stories. The good ones tell stories first, use technology in the supporting cast, just like motion pictures. The bad ones are all about tech, and you're like, eh, it's, it's okay, it's kind of boring. So that's the global games market, give or take, arguably $140 billion a year, it's not a bad haul. But the key thing I wanna talk about is not the money, it's this. They're all still trapped in this thing called the rectangle. They're trapped in something that gives us something that says this is a screen, pay attention, this is a screen, right? So, here's the equation. This is what I get to think about a lot. Screen, screen, question mark. 30 years, not really much has changed. Yes, we've formulated it with sophistication, but the actual screen is almost the same, believe it or not. It's almost the same size, actually. So here's the question. This is what I wanna know. And I, I do want you to tell me, by raising your hands or not raising your hands, do you feel like you're ready to break out of the rectangle? Put your hand up if you're ready. Let me see. Okay, about half. Like, really tell me if you are. Because I 100% are. I'm in. I, I believe this. All right. Why are we going to wear it? This is the simplest, quickest way I'm going to tell you why we're going to wear it. I spend hours and hours and hours talking to studio people about this. Here's the quick, fast way to tell you. Here's why we're going to wear it. That's why we're going to wear it. <laughs> that was from a trip this summer in China that we were on. I took some pictures as we were traveling around in mass transit, snuck pictures with my super secret pocket robot that actually functions like a camera too. People are buried, completely buried in their technology. Look at that kid. He's got the 12-hour battery pack with that thing. You think he's got neck problems? He's like 12 years old. He's going to have neck problems his whole life. This is a problem that's looking for a solution. This was an ad in the airport in China telling you very clearly, this is not a phone. They should just put a thing on the ad that said, this is not a phone. There are guys, it's, he's a famous soccer player or something, is holding it up to his face, saying, you don't use this thing like a phone. Let me show you where it belongs. This is a clear indicator of where we're headed. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen overnight. Doesn't mean there's not gonna be bumps in the road. There will be plenty of bumps in the road. And by the way, we've been through those bumps, right? Mid-90s, we tried. 
Technology was somewhat there. VR goes mass market, mid-90s. Okay, not quite. That's what I call VR wave one in my history of VR. Tied to a million dollar computer, the headset cost half a million dollars. Okay, didn't quite get to mass market, but it was incredibly formative and incredibly close to what we have today. This is the current version of that wave. It's what we call LBE. I do not believe this is gonna be a big deal. I believe this is gonna be what I call a cottage industry, a sideline, not the real thing. We can talk more about that. Because really it hasn't evolved much from the mid 90s. It's kind of the same stuff, except we like wear the computer on our back now, which isn't the future either. You wanna see wave two? This is where it got really interesting for me, this little moment in time. I like having the chairs to sit down and watch. So Matthew, can you hear me? Yeah. What do you think about this experience? I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. Did you look up in the sky yet, that you can see the sky? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> He's, killing He's busy killing zombies. Sky's oh. cool. <laughs> <laughs> so this was about five years ago. That's my son. He's 15. I brought him there after I saw this. This is literally a garage startup at the time. These kids were like doing this in their boxer shorts, waking up at two in the afternoon. Oh, They've become about a hundred company, hundred person company now. And um, oh, yeah. the thing that was so formative about this, was so important oh, nice. about this, was that after my son played that for about five minutes, that's this early, early prototype headset with all this gack they built, they like hacked this whole thing together took off the headset, his eyes were gigantic, he looked at me, and I'll never forget the words he said. He said, Dad, he, under his breath, he's like, what? He says, I'm never playing my Xbox again. Boom, thing went right back on, and I'm like, <laughs> I knew there was something to this, I'm all in, and that was my all in moment, right? And for the next couple of years, I started getting like deeply involved in this nonsense, which now, you see, I've changed the graphic to something a little more modern, right? Current wave of VR. So these are, remarkable machines in many ways, but they have lots of problems and lots of challenges. The numbers bear out the friction and the challenges and the problems that these things have. People are always talking about, well, it didn't quite catch on, it didn't quite get to where it needs to get. This is totally catching on for what these devices are and how they work. 100% success in my book. Because these are not ready for mass market yet. There's a big reason these are not ready for mass market yet. You wanna know what it is? It's one thing. That. Anyone know what that stands for? Anyone want to guess? Yeah. You know. Of course you know, Miriam. I know you could guess. It stands for box on face. B-O-F. That's the problem with these things. They are not the right thing. They have the right essence. They are heading in the right direction. But the fact that they're a box that you put on your face means they're never going to be a mass market tool. Never. No matter how hard they try. And they will keep creeping towards the end game. But they're never going to be mass market. So for two years, I did this. I put, people's, I put people in boxes. There's a lot of actually very famous people here. Some you can see, some you can't. Most you can't because they got a box on their face, <laughs> right? But I did this for a couple years at Fox. I was like, this is something. There's something going to happen with this. It's not right yet, but it's going to happen. This is getting more right. This is wave, well, I, let's wave two. Wave 1.1, 1 .1, right? They're getting more nimble. They're getting smarter. There's still a box on your face. There's still what we call mostly three degrees of freedom. Some have six degrees of freedom, which we can talk about in Q&A or later, or maybe throughout the day, someone will give you some explanation on what it means. But the most important thing is they're getting inexpensive. They're not the end game, but you can buy an Oculus Go, which is an, a self-contained thing. You don't have to put a phone in it. It's very, very easy to use, and it's actually amazingly powerful for under 200 bucks. During Black Friday, you could have bought it for like 170 bucks. Who here has one? Great, not enough. If you're here and you're interested in this stuff, it's worth 200 bucks to dive into this thing and get one and learn what this is all about. You'll learn a lot if you get one of these. Now let's talk about this. Who here played the Wii? Almost everybody played the Wii, right? It was a super successful thing. I am gonna trip, I'm gonna kill myself, I know it. Um, because the Wii was way more than just a video game. It was what we call spatial entertainment for the home. More than a video game you actually could create something that felt real. You weren't playing a video game. You let grandma bowl in the living room. You played tennis in the living room. 
This is the beginnings of virtual reality at mass scale, even though we were still using a rectangle in our living room to do it. But this is a really, really big deal. It doesn't get the credit that it needs and deserves for starting the revolution of spatial entertainment in a home environment, in a mobile environment. The reason why we knew this is the beginnings of VR is because Nintendo at the beginning, when they released these things, they didn't realize how into the VR part of it people would get. So they didn't put safety straps on little controllers. People are laughing because you probably did this. You'd be like so into it that you'd let the controller go and it'd crack into the TV and break your TV. They eventually put safety straps on it. Okay, final act. Now we're gonna talk about sort of the last part of the journey. We're just right about on time. Let's get augmented, right? We do this already. We're in the comfort zone. We've been very softened to an augmented digital universe, our visual universe. If we're a sports fan in any way, shape, or form, we put a digital layer on top of the real world and we're very comfortable. If you went back 40, 50 years and showed people what sports are gonna look like, they'd be like, what is all that gack? Why, why, what is all that stuff going on? We like it because we're softened to it. So is there something beyond the BOF, the box on the face? You know who that is? You guys got the good one. <laughs> He's the good one, way to go. He's got a HoloLens on. There is something beyond the box on the face. This is still not right, not even close yet. But it's more right than a box on your face. That's the thing that matters about this stuff. This is what we call mixed reality. And there's a lot of big things about this that we could spend more time talking about, but pay attention to this more than box on the face. Because eventually it's gonna look like this. It's gonna look like your glasses. It's gonna look like what you're wearing right now. And it's gonna have magic inside it of a whole new order. And I'm not the only one that believes that. Here's this guy. You all know who that guy is, right? He's gotten a little trouble lately. <laughs> this was a couple years ago. He's about three or four billion dollars in on box on face. He's the guy who bought Oculus. Let's call it four, probably more. He said a couple years ago, this is the future of that. He's four billion in on this, the, the box. And he's like, that's not the future. Now, I want to be very, very clear here because I know there are video cameras rolling. What I'm gonna tell you now for the next 30 seconds has nothing to do with what I know or don't know about what Apple is doing. If you wanna know what Apple is doing, it's actually quite easy. Go into the news and look at the kind of companies Apple is buying and look at the patents they filed. That's how you'll figure it out, not from me. Because if I tell you, well, it's a problem. So, from the rumor mill, everybody gets that, right? Here's what I think about a lot about Apple. I think about this device a lot. Not because I love this device. I don't actually wear one. I have like four of them because I have to experiment with all this stuff. I don't wear them at all. But I think about how powerful this little thing is and how many things it can do in this one by one inch little square of compute power. Now just imagine in your mind's eye, not telling you anything I know or don't know, that you can take all that power that's packed in that little thing that you can wear on your wrist and spread it on a little more surface area where it kind of belongs, a visual device. You've got things to hang them on, like the mic is hanging on. You guys get it? It's probably not gonna look like that. That's from the rumor mill. But you get that you can spread that tech kind of where it makes sense, and this is gonna happen in some way, shape, or form. I'm gonna sit for four minutes and show you this, because this is a really good way to describe mixed reality. You're gonna get a little, a little look into my living room, is the best way I can describe this. All right, get ready. So now what I'm doing is actually scanning scan my living room. So it's actually scanning the world. All right, it's got the scan, and now I'm pushing this button to start the game. Okay, it's loading up. So what's pretty remarkable about this is that there's this robot creature that's floating in my field of view, and it actually looks real to me. Like it is sitting there in my living room and the smoke trails that are coming out of it are realistic. Like it actually looks like it's a real thing, which is pretty amazing. And now it's kind of opened up its little um, navigation world. So I pull out this thing, put it in there, and it's gonna open up a briefing card. Now I've played this game already for a couple of hours a few nights ago. So I'm on mission seven. Didn't quite get in there. Oh, there. There we go. Okay. Now there's my mission card. I'm pulling it out. I'm looking at the mission card. It's kind of floating in front of me. And now I'm putting it in the little holder. And there it goes. Okay. And now I'm getting ready to start the mission. I just push it with my hand. 
Uh-oh. Okay, so now the action starts. So now, in front of my little home theater screen, I have, uh, like, a portal, and now I've got to shoot this robot dude. And they're all over the place. They're literally coming out of the walls. And I'm firing stuff, and I'm kind of trying to blow them up as fast as I can. And it's super fun. So as we wrap up, I gave this similar talk in Silicon Valley, and they drew a a cartoon of the talk. So it turns out this is a really good way to remember all the things I talked about if you're like, oh, what did we talk about for the last hour? You can take a picture of that with your phone if you want. This is actually in my wallet. It's true. I got it at a Chinese restaurant in New York a couple years ago. That's kind of words to live by, and, and that's, uh, that's, my, that's my hour. So thank you, everybody.